Hi boys and girls, I am going to read just a very little bit of this book, but I want to tell you about it so that so that some of you will be interested in it. This is called The Girl Who Drew Butterflies. It's a true story. How Maria Marine's Marion's Art Changed Science. And this is a biography by Joyce Sidman. So we're just gonna kind of look into this a little bit. Um, I don't think it was my bookmark. So this has got, well, it's got some pencil drawings. This is a long time ago. The Girl Who Drew Butterflies, How Maria Marion's Art Changed Science. That's our title page. So, contents. Butterfly Glossary, The Girl in the Garden, and so these are all the different things that um, they're going to be discussing, but we're not going to go through. I'm just going to read a few pages, maybe. Eggs, hatching, molting, pupa, e-closing, expanding. So, um, let's start. So, right in the beginning, it has a butterfly glossary and insect words used throughout this book. Adult, caterpillar, chrysalis. That's always been a fascinating word. A hard case that protects a moth or a butterfly at the pupa stage of growth. So, if you check this book out, you can look at all these different things. And here is something, I'm going to read this. Um, a, the Girl in the Garden. A girl kneels in her garden. It is the year 1660, and she has just turned 13. Too old for a proper German girl to be crouching in the dirt, according to her mother. She is searching for something she discovered days ago in the chilly spring air. As she combs the emerald bushes, she looks for other telltale signs. Eggs no bigger than pinpricks or leaf edges scalloped dry by the jaws of an inching worm. Ah, she's found it. A crinkled brown cocoon anchored on a branch like a sailor's hammock. She inspects it. She inspects its crump crumpled surface. Any change since yesterday? Any sign of life within? No, not yet. Her neighbors despise the creatures that fascinate her. They believe that all flying, creeping things are pests born of filth and decay. If any of them spotted this swaddled cocoon, they would rip it off and crush the vermin within giving no thought to what it might become. But for years, she has gathered flowers for her stepfather's student studio, carried them in, and arranged them for his still-life paintings. She has studied the creatures that ride on their petals, the soft green horde bodies, of caterpillars, the shiny armor of beetles. Oh, wait, 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 I wanna show you. Here is what she was looking for, what she said looked like a hammock. So, something's going on in there. I think it's a butterfly. And then, there's the caterpillar, there's a ladybug, and there, I don't know if that's a moth or a butterfly. Anyway. Um, bodies of caterpillars, the shiny armor of beetles, the delicate wings of moths. She has looked at them closely, sketched and painted them. In learning the skills of an artist, she has learned to look and watch and wonder. Imagine this girl, forbidden from training, as either a scholar or a master artist because she is female. Aware that in nearby villages, women have been banged as witches, hanged, hanged as witches for something as simple as showing too many in interest in evil vermin. Yet she is drawn to these small, mysterious lives. She does not believe the local lore that summer birds or butterflies creep out from under earth. She thinks there is a connection between butterflies, moths, caterpillars, and the rumpled brown cocoon before her, and she is determined to find it. This is her story. There's a beautiful tulip and a ladybug.
Okay, this was in Europe. I'm just going to show you a couple things here. This was in Europe in the year 1650. So there's Sweden, Norway, there's Russia, Lithuania, Denmark, Poland, there's Germany, or the states of Germ the German states, France, Kingdom of Castile, and we have a picture. Small, silent, swelling to roundness. I do not yet know what secrets I hold, what marvels await me. She's talking about a butterfly egg, which is right there, I believe. Chapter 1, The Egg, April 2nd, 1647, in Frankfurt, Germany. Maria Sibylla Marion was born on a bright spring day into a family of printers and engravers. Her father, Mathos Marion, the elder, ran a thriving Frankfurt publishing shop staffed by Mir Maria's older half-brothers and sisters from an earlier marriage. Maria's mother, Johanna, ran the household. In a family business in the 1600s, every hand was busy and the workshop hummed with motion. There was ink to be mixed, paint powder to grind, and copper plates to polish and wipe. There were stacks of paper to dampen before printing and printed proofs to examine. It looked like they kept a lot of people busy. I'm going to flip through another couple of pages because I want to get to the part where it tells you what she did. Okay, and then we go to chapter 2, which is the hatching. Before Maria could learn much from her talented father, he died while visiting a mineral spring to take the waters for his health. This left his young wife, Johanna, and three-year-old Maria in a precarious position. Although a widow would sometimes manage her late husband's affairs, Mathaus's sons from his previous marriage were grown men and quickly took charge of the family business. Johanna no longer fit into the Meridian house or the Marian household. Well, they've just gotten rid of her. Within a year, Johanna married the artist Jacob Morell. Morell specialized in painting ornamental flowers, wildly popular in Europe at the time, especially tulips, which had hundreds of varieties. Many artists like Morell had turned away from historic or religious subjects. The public was demanding a new kind of art that focused on familiar household objects, such as flowers, food, or pottery. The new style of painting was called still life. This an engraving from a Flemish artist, Jacob Hofnagel's book, Diverse Insects, published in 1630, which was widely used as a reference for artists. Though beautifully depicted, the insects in this book were not drawn to scale, and Hofnagel had no sense of their origin. So she is really still interested in insects, and she's looking at everything she can. We're not going to go into much more of this book, but um, if you want to read about a really interesting person and how we found out so much about these things, then you need to check this book out, The Girl Who Drew Butterflies. Um, let's see. This looks pretty weird. Sheltered on this underside, I began to explore all the glittering green before me. How much of it will I devour? That is the first instar phase between moltings of a caterpillar's life. So I'm going to read just a little bit of this. 1655, chapter 3, first instar. Art was a joy, but also a business that involved the entire household. Along with chores, with other chores, Maria's mother taught her to sew and embroider important skills in a time when all clothing was hand, made by hand. Her stepfather, Jacob Merrill, 
put her to work in a studio. Maria arranged flowers and fetched painting supplies for Merrill and his apprentices. Since each studio made its own art materials, Maria learned how to draft or how to craft delicate brushes from bird feathers and fur and to grind mineral powders used to color paint. Morel also taught Maria how to draw, and she took to it right away. First, she traced the work of other artists, the curve of a petal, the spiral of a snail, and then, using only lightly a lightly drawn grid, she duplicated those shapes exactly on a separate piece of paper. Finally, she tried her own drawings freehand, looking closely at the fragrant blooms, recreating their soft petals with washes of watercolor. Following her stepfather's example, she experimented with light and dark using the contrast to create texture. As a last touch, she slipped in a tiny caterpillar or summer bird to help bring her composition to life. In Maria's time, the best blue paint powder was made from ground lapis lazuli, a semi-precious stone which produced a beautiful clear blue, but was also very expensive. And I'll show you this picture in a second. It says, there are no confirmed sketches from Maria's early years, but this 1669 pen and ink drawing is often attributed to her. Note the faint grid lines that would help her copy a master artist's drawing in order to learn proper placement and proportion of objects on the page. I guess you can see that grid. These are beautiful. I've seen things like this. Maria learned how to paint by copying images of her stepfathers. This 1640 painting by Jacob Merrill is from a catalog used by flower merchants to advertise newly cultivated varieties for sale. And so I'll read this by Maria and then I'll close this. I was always encouraged to embellish my flower painting with caterpillars, summer birds, and such little animals in the same manner as landscape painters do to enliven the one through the other. Okay, class. Somebody is going to really enjoy this book. Come in and check it out. Bye for now.